Well, good evening and thank you again for joining with us on another Wednesday night as we come together around the Word of God just to study God's Word together. If you've been able to join for some of the singing prior to the service, well, I hope that you've been blessed by that. I love the last hymn, When We All Get to Heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we'll sing and shout the victory. However, there are still many people today who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Saviour, and therefore we have the responsibility to take the gospel to where they are. And that's why we're doing this series of studies that I've called Important Questions Regarding Evangelism. We have days of great opportunity during this lockdown, this pandemic, but also we have great accountability and it's so important that we do all that we can to make the message of the gospel known. So thank you for joining with us. We do appreciate that. If you don't come to our church in Banbridge, well, we thank you for joining with us. If your own meeting isn't on tonight, we just pray that God will presence himself with us and that we will be moved and encouraged and challenged through the word of God again that we consider together. But let's just pray together and let's ask for God's help and for his blessing as we come around his word. Just before we read it, let's pray for God's help. Our God and our Father, we Thank you again just now that we're able to bow our hearts in your most holy presence. We come to you, our Father, with a deep sense of our own unworthiness, realising that you are a thrice holy God. Father, we remember how your word tells us this evening how that the cherubim and the seraphim, those holy angels, veil themselves in your presence and they cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. So we recognise, our Father, that when we come into your presence, we're coming into the presence of the only true and living God, the one who has no rivals, the one who cannot be compared to anyone else, because you are God and you are God alone. Father, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us, not just down through history, but in these last days you have spoken unto us through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He came into the world to save sinners just like us, to reveal the Father to us. We thank you that he went one day to an old rugged cross, and there he suffered and he bled and died for our sins. We thank you, Father, for the grace of God that has brought us to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour. We thank you for the knowledge of sins forgiven. We thank you for the reminder in your word that we are accepted in your well-beloved Son and that we are members of God's great spiritual family. So we come to you, our Father, and we Thank you for this day and for all your goodness to us. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you bring to us in life. Your word tells us of your people of old that whenever you blessed them and brought them into a land that they didn't own, and when you gave them things that they needed for daily survival, Father, as the days passed, they forgot about you and they forgot about the kindness and the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And Father, we would never want to do that. We want to take a moment to thank you for every blessing, both temporal and spiritual, that you pour upon these lives of ours every single day. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for these Wednesday nights when we can come together, when we can read it together, and then meditate upon it. As we do that again just now, we pray that the Holy Spirit will help us in all our meditation upon your word. We thank you, Father, for these studies on the subject of evangelism. 
We realize that we have been given a great commission when we have been told to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And Father, these are days of lockdown when perhaps we see days of difficulty. However, we need to lift up our eyes and look out on the fields that are white and ready to harvest, for these may well be days of opportunity for us when people we know who are locked in at the moment have opportunity to think about spiritual things and to talk about the message of the gospel. So we pray, Father, that you would teach us from your word this evening. We pray, Father, that as we read it together, that the word of God will be hidden deep within our hearts. And as we seek to learn lessons that would equip us to be better at this work of evangelism, we pray that you'd speak to us individually and that we might, our Father, have the courage to take the message of the gospel out and to tell others of Jesus, who's mighty and well able to save. Bless all who listen in. Bless each one of us with all our individual needs. Remember those, our Father, who will listen through the CDs or DVDs. We pray your blessing upon them as well. Father, we take a moment to think of the world in which we live with all its trouble and turmoil. We have seen in the States, our Father, some horrific events in recent nights. Lord, we thank you that you're a sovereign God. And we just ask, Father, that you would keep your hand upon the world in which we live. Lord, these are difficult days for many of your people. And we just ask, Lord, that you would protect them throw a shield around them and be with them, our Father, and be with each one of us as we steer ourselves through this world with all its ups and downs and with the many changes that are taking place. But just now draw near to us, Father, and bless us as we come to your word and as we fellowship together in this way. We ask a giving thanks for all your goodness to us in our Saviour's precious and worthy name. Amen. Amen. Now, if you have a Bible, just please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 again. I read these verses last week, and I think they're the right verses to read again this evening as we come back to the study that we had commenced last Wednesday night. What is the message in our evangelism? So I want to read to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this great chapter on the doctrine of the resurrection, but there's so much more, and I want to read at verse 1 through to verse 20. Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remains unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so ye believe. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? 
But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Amen. God will add his blessing to this reading from his word. We were thinking last Wednesday night as this little series continued on the great question, what is the message in our evangelism? Well, the Apostle Paul, when he came to that great cosmopolitan city of Corinth, a wicked and a vile place, he brought the message of the gospel because only the message of the gospel was suffice. And this is what we read in 1 Corinthians 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And Paul reminds us there of the content of the message that he preached. It was not the wisdom of men, it was the testimony of God. It was God's message because it was God's revealed truth, and it centered on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I suggested to you last week that First of all, this message is a biblical message. Now, you can use whatever methods you feel are suitable for the people that you try to reach. But whilst you may use different methods, there is only one message that we can share with others. And we must never, no matter how little fruit we see or how difficult the work is that God has called us to do, we must never rewrite the gospel to make it acceptable to our modern world. That would be a great mistake because the gospel that we have entrusted to our care is the gospel of God. And when you and I share that gospel with others, we must not make any assumption that the people we're sharing the gospel with really understand what we're saying. So we must bring to them the truth of God as the creator of all things. We want to show people that God is not only the one who has created all things out of nothing and sustains all things by the word of his power, but he also wants what is best for us. And therefore, we must also present God as the Savior of all men. If God wants the best for us and we want the best from God, then the problem of sin needs to be dealt with in our lives. And that's why God sent his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world. He came to be our Savior, to offer up himself as an offering for sin. And through the Lord Jesus Christ, we can know our sins forgiven, we can be reconciled to God, and we can enjoy the best of what God has in store for his people. But remember, this gospel is an historical fact. In other words, our faith is an historical faith. Both Christian and non-Christian have written about the cross work of Jesus Christ and the empty tomb. And of course, the cross is central to our faith. We know that from our reading of the New Testament and also, of course, the Old Testament. The truth is evident in the Gospels. It's central in the writings 
of the Apostle Paul, it's preeminent in the epistle to the Hebrews, evident in the writings of the Apostle Peter, it's evident in the writings of John, and it's evident in the book of Revelation, and for the last 2,000 years it has been evident in the testimony of the church. So I want you to remember that this is a biblical message. God has not only created us, but he alone can save us. Our faith is an historical faith, and the cross, which is a solid evangelical historical event, also brings us great theological truth. But I want to pick it up there tonight and move to something that is also very important. You see, this is not just a biblical message, it is also a personal message. Unlike the philosophies of men, which can be debated and discussed so often and never come to any kind of an agreement, the message given to us by God has got important personal implications, and therefore the gospel needs to be understood with a sense of great urgency. Let me explain to you what I mean, because this needs to be viewed in two personal ways. First of all, it relates to personal experience. The message of the gospel has got something to say to every single individual, and therefore it has got something to say to each one of us personally. It's not just a message that deals with historical fact, although it does that. It is not just a message that is based on theological truth, although it is that. The reality is that the gospel message is a life-changing message. It can change the life of any individual, no matter how deep down in sin they might be. What I'm saying to you tonight is this, that the gospel really works. We know that because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. And it's the only message tonight that can transform the life of the individual. It relates to personal experience. The second thing is, is that it demands a personal response. The claims of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the individual life must be treated seriously by every individual. Because as far as Christ is concerned, we are either for him or we are against him. In other words, when people hear the gospel, they must either say yes or no to the claims of Jesus Christ upon their lives. You see, they cannot remain neutral as far as Jesus Christ is concerned. They cannot remain indifferent to their need. They cannot pretend that the message of the gospel has no bearing on their lives. The truth is that when individually we hear the gospel preached, a response one way or another is inevitable. We ought not to be afraid, therefore, to ask people to seriously consider the claims of the gospel, to ask them what they're going to do with the Lord Jesus Christ, because what they do with him in time is going to determine where they're going to be in eternity. Let me take your mind back for a moment to Acts chapter 2. You'll remember that day because that was the day of Pentecost, and you'll know that the Apostle Peter preached a tremendous sermon on the day of Pentecost, and it was a message that he made personal to his hearers who had come from every art and part to the city of Jerusalem at that time. Now, the message that he preached was personal, and it was so direct that the hearts of the people were moved 
their conscience was pricked, and they said to Peter, What must we do? What must we do? The fact is that with Jesus Christ, you have to do something. The message of the gospel demands a response. Maybe you're listening in tonight and you're not a Christian. You've heard the gospel throughout your lifetime. It's not that you don't know the way of salvation because you do. And furthermore, you have witnessed the power of the gospel in changing the lives of your loved ones and you've seen the tremendous transformation that has taken place in their lives. But you personally... You have not yet responded to the claims of Jesus Christ. And as far as you're concerned, you're maybe saying to yourself, well, you know what? I'm not in the place yet where I want to think about these things. I'm not at that place where I'm going to make a decision too hastily. Well, the reality is that every time you hear the gospel preached and you remain unmoved and unsaved, You have already made your decision very clear because you have already rejected God's salvation and you have decided that you will not have the Lord Jesus Christ to rule over you. And so I say to you tonight lovingly and urgently, if you know the way of salvation, If you know that Jesus Christ has come to be your Saviour and you know that you've no other hope this side of eternity and you've thought about it but done nothing about it, then I appeal to you tonight to come to Christ. I appeal to you to seek the Lord Jesus Christ while he is yet to be found. If you reject his offer of salvation, then heaven you will never see. This message of the gospel, it's biblical and it's also personal. And you and I need to think about how we react to it. But I want to develop that a little further tonight. Because going back to the Acts chapter 2 passage where we turn to one of the great evangelistic sermons that has ever been preached, There are a number of things that are emphasized which are important as far as our message is concerned in evangelism. And these verses are important as far as the personal nature of the message is concerned. Now what an important day the day of Pentecost was. We know that the Holy Spirit came as the Saviour had promised And when he came, he manifested himself in great power. Is that not what we need today more than anything? That the Holy Spirit would come again in mighty power and manifest himself in the preaching and in the people of God and in the pew as people listen to the gospel? The disciples themselves were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were filled with renewed boldness and enthusiasm as they began the work of evangelism. If you and I are not filled tonight with the Holy Spirit and if we have not got boldness and enthusiasm and a passion in our hearts, our evangelism is not going to be of much use. But the people who were present on that occasion in Acts chapter 2, they were amazed and they were challenged about these miraculous events. And if you take time to read Acts chapter 2, you'll discover that the Apostle Peter gives what I might call a defense and a declaration. In other words, he came to these confused people and he defended the witness and the worship of these believers in Jerusalem. He explained what was taking place and of course he quoted from the prophecy of Joel to show that prophecy was actually being fulfilled in their midst. But then he went on and when he went on he proclaimed 
Jesus Christ as Lord and Messiah. And that sermon made such an impact on the lives of those people. But there were a certain number of things that we could easily miss about that day and about that message and about this sermon that we need to understand when it comes to the work of evangelism. Let me explain to you what needs to be part, a big part of the message that we share with others. The first thing is this, we need to stress the need of repentance. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, remember those people were convicted by what he had to say, and they turned around and they said, what must we do? In other words, Peter, what do we have to do to make things right? If we're guilty in crucifying our Messiah, what must we do to put things right? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter told them to repent. And although the gospel message has many aspects to it, we must always begin by urging men and women to repent of their sin and to turn to Jesus Christ. This message of repentance was not something that was strange alone to Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. In the New Testament, there are so many other examples of the emphasis that is placed upon the need for repentance. Let me highlight just a few examples without much talk about them. Firstly, whenever John the Baptist came as the forerunner for the Lord Jesus Christ, he preached a message of repentance. Matthew 3 verse 1 and 2 says this, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Secondly, when Jesus Christ began his earthly ministry, he also called the people to repentance. Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Thirdly, whenever the twelve disciples were sent out with their message, it was exactly the same, Mark 6, 12. And they went out and preached that men should repent. Fourthly, when the Lord Jesus Christ gave the Great Commission, after his resurrection, the commission demanded repentance, Luke 24, 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And then, of course, fifthly, we have what I've already referred to, Peter in Acts 2, repent and be baptized. Beloved, the importance of repentance is seen here by the place that it occupies and by the emphasis that it is given in the Scriptures. And in our evangelistic preaching, in our everyday personal evangelism, we need to stress the need for repentance. That means the holiness of God must be preached. That means that the sinfulness of man must be preached. That means that the law of God must be preached. In other words, men and women need to be made aware of who God is, of what they have done in breaking God's law, and that they need to repent of their sin if they're ever going to know God's forgiveness. Too often today, sadly, it's not a criticism, but it's a comment, 
Sadly, far too many people in evangelism, they don't put too much effort on sin, lest people are offended. And over the years, more and more, there's even less emphasis placed on the subject of repentance. You might say to me tonight, well, John, what is repentance? What's involved? How do we explain it to other people? Well, let me tell you some things very briefly about repentance. Repentance is the first aspect of the believer's initial experience of what salvation is. It's what you and I would call conversion. True conversion to Christ is an essential part and proof of regeneration. So we can put it like this. Regeneration is God working in, and conversion is man working out his salvation in repentance and in faith. So as far as repentance is concerned, it involves a number of things because it involves the whole person. Firstly, it involves the mind being awakened. In other words, a person needs to be convinced about their sin. This is a change of mind or view regarding one's obligation to the will and to the word of God. And that's why we need to pray much for the conversion of others. Only the Spirit of God can quicken a dead man and awaken the mind of the unbeliever. But it involves the mind being awakened. Secondly, it involves the heart feeling its guilt in the sight of a holy God. You see, true repentance will involve a hatred of sin and a genuine sorrowing over that sin. That's different from remorse. You see, remorse is sorrow for the consequences of our sin. Repentance condemns the sin that brought about the consequences in the first place. It involves the mind being awakened. It involves the heart feeling its guilt. Thirdly, it involves the will being changed because it means a turning from sin and a turning on to God. A good example of this for us is perhaps the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. Remember how this young man came to his father and he asked for his part of the inheritance and he went off, left the father's house, went into far places and he wasted his substance in riotous living. But in Luke 15 verse 18, when this young man realized the mess he had made of his life and realized the sin that marked his life, this is what he said. He said, I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Fourthly, it involves a complete turnaround. It means a new change of direction in someone's life. You see, it's not just an inward action of the soul. It is an outwardly manifested, complete change in someone's life. Sin must be repented of, but that sin must also be forsaken. There seems to be this idea today that you can become a Christian and repent of your sin and go on with Christ and still live in your sin at the same time. That's not possible. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Sin must be repented of and it must also be forsaken. 
You and I want a clear example of that. We see it in the lives of the believers in Thessalonica. First Thessalonians 1 verse 9 and 10 says this, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols, to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now we must understand that these people were thinking about in the church of Thessalonica. They had been steeped in pagan idolatry, in false worship for generations. But the gospel had come to them in power, and these people had been transformed by the power of the gospel, and they turned. They turned to God from their idols, and they not only turned to God, but they were so excited about this that they were waiting for his Son from heaven who would deliver them from the wrath to come. That's what repentance is all about. It's a turning from our sin. It's leaving that sin behind. It's turning unto God, living for him, loving him, walking with him, fellowshipping with him, serving him. It's all about him. It means a change of direction and a whole new way of life. And if our message does not stress the need of repentance, then our message is defective. We're not preaching the whole counsel of God. You say to me, but that's a very costly thing to ask of anybody. You're asking people just to leave everything behind and step out. No, I'm not asking people to do anything. I'm asking them to listen to the Word of God and to repent of their sin. Going back to what Peter said in Acts 2, he said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Now, I'm not going to get bogged down in baptism, but those people in Peter's day were baptized to show that their repentance was genuine, that publicly they were willing to identify themselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a means of showing to others that their allegiance to Jesus Christ was crystal clear. And for these people, that was a very costly demand that was being placed upon them. After all, they were being asked to forsake their sin. They were being asked to turn from their old ways. And they were being asked to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in obedience and to identify with him. Friends, we need to be honest with people. And we need to speak and stress the need for repentance in their lives. Firstly, we need to stress the nature of repentance. Secondly, we need to stress the nature of salvation. While it's right and necessary to stress the need for repentance, we need to offer men and women today hope through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to tell them of all that he has done for sinners just like them and us at the cross. We need to offer them something that can change them, someone who can satisfy their every need. After all, the gospel is good news. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and men and women need to be reminded that this salvation that comes through Christ, it comes without money, it comes without price, it is full and it is free, but it was purchased at tremendous cost through the shedding of the Lord Jesus Christ's precious blood. When you and I speak to them about salvation, we ourselves need to understand that this is a very, very comprehensive term. Their salvation from the past, their salvation in the present, 
and there's also salvation for the future. There is salvation from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and one day from the very presence of sin itself, Galatians chapter 1. There is salvation, and then there is ongoing sanctification. There is justification, and then there is one day glorification. Now, all of these things, they are all tied up in what you and I call salvation. They need to be addressed. You say to me, but Pastor, how do we do that? Did you not say to us in a previous study that we assume too much regarding this day and generation. So many of these people don't understand these things. Well, then we need to explain them. How are they ever going to understand what salvation is and what it costs and what it cost the Lord Jesus Christ to purchase it if we don't speak and explain these biblical terms? I understand that this is a different day, and I understand that things around us are changing. But, beloved, salvation is a wonderful thing, and we must remind men and women today of this great salvation, or the writer to the Hebrews says this so great salvation that God offers them in Jesus Christ. You know what makes it so great? Not only that it was bought at a great price and it speaks about a great saviour and a great salvation, but salvation from sin's curse, salvation from sin's power, salvation from sin's presence, all of these things made possible through our Lord Jesus Christ. But then we have a difficulty, don't we? Because whenever you and I begin to talk about salvation and we explain to people about the way of the cross and how that Christ has purchased salvation for us, and people will say, well, that's not what I believe. That's not what I understand salvation to be. That's not what I'm taught. As far as I'm concerned, I'm one of those people who just believes this thing simply, and I believe that all roads lead to God. Well, they don't. And you and I must lovingly and tenderly and truthfully explain to people why it's the way of the cross that leads home. There's only one gospel message. There's only one Savior for sinners. And if people don't know him, and they don't know much about him, don't assume that they know anything. Just begin and explain to them things that they need to know about the Lord Jesus. What are those things? Well, I'll run through these very quickly. I'll leave it there tonight and pick it up again next week. Let me run through a number of things that we today need to teach people. First of all, we need to teach them about the humanity of Christ. In other words, you and I need to explain to them the incarnation. We need to explain to them how he came and how it was by means of a virgin birth, how it was in fulfillment of prophecy, how that he came just at the right time, and how it was in God's time. And we need to tell them why he came as a babe to Bethlehem's manger. You see, whenever it comes to Christmas, sometimes we get so carried away with the season that we don't adequately explain about the Saviour. But we must, if people are going to understand the nature of this man. We need to teach them about the humanity of Christ. The second thing is we need to teach them about the deity of Christ because this is, after all, the God-man. Yes, he was truly man, but he's also truly God. He was and he is God, and we need to seek to explain that to people because 
There are many cults today who are undermining the deity and the authority and the supremacy of Christ. And we need to explain these things so people understand the kind of person Jesus is. Thirdly, we need to teach people about the character of Christ. They need to know that he's very different from us, that he knew no sin, that he had no sin of his own, that he did no sin, and that that's the way it had to be for only one who knew no sin could take the sinner's place. We need to do what John the Baptist did, point people to Jesus and say to them, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. He who knew no sin, dying for sinners on the cross, that our sins might be forgiven. What a message! What a hope for the world in which we live. We need to thirdly explain to the people the character of Christ. They need to know he's different, yes. But fourthly, we need to teach people the love of Christ. There is no love like the love of Jesus. So often we sing that. But we need to remind people that he loves them. And that he loved us. And that he gave himself for us. And we need to remind them that that on that cross was erected on Golgotha's hillside, that that was the greatest manifestation of love that this old world will ever see. And fifthly, we need to teach people about the death of Christ. You see, Christianity is a religion of redemption. And Christianity is a message of atonement. And you and I need to explain to people the need and the nature of Christ's death. It's one thing to say redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed through the blood of the Lamb. What does that mean to our world outside? We need to take them to the cross. We need to explain the message of the cross. We need to explain the death of Jesus Christ and why it took place and why he died there. That's all part of the message that we explain. You see, there are a number of things that you and I must stress whenever it comes to the work of God and to the message of the gospel. And time is gone and I'm going to leave it there tonight, but I'll pick it up next week again because thinking about the death of Christ, which was our last point, I want to explain that a little bit more. And I want to make it simple so that we realize that when we go out with this message, there are so many simple things about the death of Christ that we can explain to others that they might understand it. But that will do us for tonight. We'll pick it up next week. Let's just pray together as we come to the end of this part of our Bible study. Our God and our Father, we thank you so much for the message of the gospel. We thank you, Father, that it's not only biblical, but also that it's personal. And men and women tonight, when they hear the gospel, Father, they have a responsibility to come believing, to come to Jesus and to look and to live. But we are, Father, who share the message with them. We have an awesome responsibility to make it simple, to stress those things that are so important so that people understand who Jesus is and all that he came to do and all that he has already accomplished through his death. Father, bless your word to us tonight and do send us out to tell others about the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we humbly pray. Amen. Amen. I want simply to thank you for joining with us tonight and to encourage you wherever you are, just to bow your head and to take just a few minutes to, first of all, pray that God would bless his word to each of us, 
to pray that God will help us in this great work of evangelism, that we'll grasp these days of opportunity and we'll make Jesus Christ known. Ask God also to move amongst us at this time, not just in our own local church, but right across this country of ours and right across the world. Some horrific scenes being shown to us from uh, the United States at the moment and on other places as well, of course, and this virus ongoing, lots of people dying in many, many countries across our world, including our own. And people are plunged into great distress and people are finding it hard to cope and find there's nothing to live for anymore. Well, you and I know better than that and we need to pray for people and we need to do what we can to bring comfort and consolation to them through the gospel of God's grace. Do remember too to pray for our government, those in authority over us, and remember for those at Stormont as these various phases take place. We trust and pray that the changes will come very soon. Being on Facebook will be no longer necessary on a Wednesday night or on a Sunday. We'll soon be back worshipping together and rejoicing in the grace and in the goodness of God. Remember then these things. Remember every local church, every minister, every pastor, every missionary. Let's pray that God will undertake for them and for us. And as we commend you to the Lord and to his grace, may God's blessing rest upon each one of us. May God keep us safe and help us. God willing, we'll be back again on Sunday, the Lord's Day, meeting for hymn singing at 11 o'clock prior to our meeting on Facebook at half past 11, again half past six at night with singing at six o'clock. And we would love it if you're free and you don't listen in to any other meetings. We'd love it if you would come and that you would join with us on Sunday. So in the meantime, God bless and please take care.